Hello, coming at you live from Minnesota. Bow, 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 bow. It's Tim Walls. If you didn't catch, uh, he's the VP pick, and I want to talk about it today on VP Watch 2024 in this emergency episode. Y'all, I am caffeinated. These are the vibes I'm on, okay? And I'd like you to, to get on board, so please get on my level. On Tuesday, Kamala Harris announced her running mate and VP the pick is Tim Walls, my governor here in Minnesota. Um, and let me tell you, my emotions have been mixed, mainly because um, with Walls at the helm here in Minnesota, uh, we have become one of the most progressive states in the union, okay? He passed sweeping progressive reform here last year, including billions of dollars in new funding for schools and infrastructure, universal free school meals for students, free tuition at public college for low-income families. He's had a goal to get to 100% clean electricity by 2040, created statewide paid leave programs, legalized marijuana, passed stricter gun laws, gave unauthorized immigrants access to driver's license, eliminated nearly all state abortion restrictions, protected gender-affirming care for trans youth, and proposed codifying Minnesota abortion rights and restoring voting rights for the formerly incarcerated, okay? That's Tim Walls. That's who we're talking about. But who is he really? The internet is home to some pretty shady things and it can create a real danger to your personal safety in a lot of ways, not least of which being the ability for anyone anywhere to find out your personal information. Yikes. Yikes. The newest scam trick that I've seen people try is sending these random conversational texts from an unknown number. Literally, as I was writing that last sentence for the script, I got one that just said, good morning. I've also gotten some that just say, hi, how are you? And what are you doing? These texts are unnerving, and I could see how someone could fall for it, especially if they're waiting for a text from someone or don't know that this is a scam that's going around. One reason that I'm getting these spammy calls and texts is because big companies can't keep our data safe. AT&T recently revealed that over 73 million customer records, both existing and former customers, were released on the dark web. So what can you do to protect yourself? I use Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura will alert me if they find my phone number or any other sensitive information has been compromised, and they give me fast fraud alerts if anyone tries to use that data to access my credit or bank accounts. Aura does so much more to keep me safe too. I also get things like transaction monitoring, a VPN, antivirus, a password manager, and identity theft insurance. I get all of this in one app at one affordable price. I can also get their AI-powered call assistant that will pick up unknown calls on my behalf to screen them for spam or scams. The AI forwards legitimate calls to me so I don't miss appointments, deliveries, and emergencies. And it protects me from harmful text messaging by filtering out known spam numbers and scanning links in the message for phishing threats. If cutting down on the spam in your life is something you're interested in, you can go to aura.com slash Lija to start your two week free trial. The link is in the description below. Thanks Aura. Honestly, a lot of what I just said makes me kind of nervous about um, his clout with more moderate voters, which is something that Harris is concerned about, uh, rightfully so, because uh, those were some pretty sweeping progressive reforms, though they are widely popular with Minnesotans. He did catch some flack for his COVID-19 response. Some people were mad about him, like closing things down and giving a shit about public health and stuff, but um, otherwise largely really popular. Um, however, I want to talk about his background because I think his pedigree, his life prior to all those sweeping reforms, make him a good candidate to round out Kamala Harris's candidacy. He was born and grew up in a tiny town in Nebraska, which balances Harris's elite West Coast credentials, you know, um, adding to his everyman non-elitist credentials. He served in the Army National Guard for 25 years, I believe. He was deployed overseas, rose to the rank of command sergeant major, and then retired from the military. Um, he went to a state college in Nebraska. He spent a year teaching in China and can still converse in Mandarin. He got a master's degree at a state university in Minnesota. Also, as I was saying that, I can definitely see a conservative talking point coming up saying like, well, he lived in China for a year, so like probably in bed with the Chinese government. Don't let them fool you. He was one year in like the 90s. Okay, calm down. And the fact that he's at least vaguely bilingual is more than I think a lot of our politicians can say. Uh, he got a master's degree at a state university in Minnesota. And after that, he was a high school geography teacher. He met his wife uh, at, when he was working as a high school geography teacher in Nebraska in the 90s. And they have two children who they conceived through IVF, edgy. While uh, he was teaching geography, he was also the football coach and the faculty advisor to the Student Gay Straight Alliance in the 90s. Talk about progressive. He... Um, obsessively drinks diet Mountain Dew and does not consume coffee or alcohol. That's because, as far as I can tell, he got a DUI once in the 90s and then 
learned a lesson, grew as a person, quit drinking alcohol, and now like obsessively drinks Diet Mountain Dew, which kind of makes him as of the people as one can be, frankly, more than J.D. Vance could ever hope to be with his Diet Mountain Dew stories. This is a man who's uh, guzzling that stuff just trying to keep it straight and narrow, you know what I mean? That's relatable. Uh, he also gets car sick and can only ride in the front seat even when being driven in fancy hired cars, also highly relatable. His chief of staff has worked with him for 18 years, which says a lot if you work for your same boss for 18 years, that's a long time, okay? Uh, he served in the US House of Representatives starting in 2006. He served a largely conservative rural Southern Minnesota district, and he beat out a six-term Republican incumbent to win that seat. He served six terms in the U.S. House of Representatives, being known as someone who was able to cooperate, reach across the aisle, work on bipartisan issues. And then he ran and won his seat as Minnesota's governor in 2018 and won re-election handily in 2022, despite complaints from Republicans, um, again, about uh, COVID, but also about spending down our huge budget surplus, you know, the government budget met to like pay for government services and stuff. They were mad that he spent it on government services and stuff. He is popular with workers and unions, having championed wor union organizing, workers' rights, and an increased minimum wage. The man knows how to communicate. He's down to earth. He talks in clear terms that don't make it feel like you're listening to a politician who's trying to avoid answering the question, you know? It's kind of breaking that spell again of saying, look, he's not offering you anything. And then we dang sure better be ready to offer something. We have to show them that this isn't there's nothing strange about this. You know, they'll try and say this ultra liberal. That's where we need to be more specific. Oh, do you mean the, the free school lunches? Is that what you are, are the roads and bridges we built in this town? Is that what you're speaking about? Governor, you spent a surplus money on this. Yeah, you mean when we eliminated the Social Security tax for most of seniors? Is that that's the one that most bothers you? There's never a specific. They don't give you a specific on what what the liberal agenda is. And we have to do a better job of saying this is what it is. And that's a quality that I think Trump supporters think Trump has when really he just rambles and says offensive shit once in a while. Walls speaks in a down to earth accessible way that is actually what I think people who think they like how Trump talks are looking for, if that makes sense. He's also genuinely funny. He gives strong dad or grandpa vibes. He has a 23-year-old daughter, so he even knows about Brat Summer, y'all, okay? He is a universally palatable guy, I would venture to say. That being said, like I said, those really progressive policies he pushed in Minnesota make me nervous about him as a VP pick. I was actually strongly in favor of Mark Kelly for VP. He's from Arizona, super important swing state. He was an astronaut. I mean, conservatives and moderates love that shit, right? Uh, he was a husband to incredibly popular Gabby Giffords. And I think he would appeal maybe more strongly than Tim Walls would to moderates. That being said, Mark Kelly is a Senate Democrat and we frankly can't lose a single Democrat in the U.S. Senate right now. And there's no guarantee that Arizona would replace him with a Democrat in a special election scenario. So like, as much as I was pushing for Mark Kelly, mainly because I didn't want y'all to be taking Tim Walls, but also because Tim Walls is pretty progressive. Um, and that makes me nervous about swing voters and moderates. Um, that being said, I think I'm okay with Mark Kelly keeping keeping that Senate seat Democratic, if you, you know what I mean, okay? Um, also on the potential list was Andy Bashir. Um, frankly, I don't like his face. Sorry, he's got an unelectable face. There's something about it. I don't trust the guy. I don't trust him. And as silly as that is, and not actually based on any facts or policy or whatever, that's how people vote. That's how people vote. We can pretend all day that that's not, but that is how people vote, okay? Um, and Shapiro was also in the running, but I think came with way too much baggage and Zionism to make him um, a very viable candidate. I do think that Walls was the correct choice in this. However, now the job of the Harris Walls campaign um, is to introduce Walls to voters. We love him here in Minnesota. He's got great approval ratings, but an ABC News Ipsos survey found that nearly nine in 10 U.S. adults don't know enough about him or have no opinion of him. Um, he didn't come in with the name recognition that someone like Mark Kelly has. That being said, his public profile has risen dramatically, literally in just the last two weeks. A conversation he had in which he called Republicans a bunch of weirdos went viral. And now everyone in the Democratic Party is calling Republicans a bunch of weirdos. And Republicans are like, we, we're not weird. And they really don't know how to, what to do with it. And I love that. I love that for us. Other videos of him are circulating widely on social media. People are, people are discovering that he's witty, that he can talk like a regular person and not some creepy, slimy politician. Frankly, 
I think it's largely been positive, the, the overall national public reception of him, at least over here in my personal social media echo chamber, okay? So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, but just generally speaking about polling, uh, nine in 10 U.S. adults say they have a favorable opinion of military veterans generally, according to another Ipsos poll conducted in 2024. About eight in 10 say that about school teachers as well. Both measures are much higher than for government employees or elected officials. So despite the fact that he has been an elected official for uh, most of the last two decades, um, the fact that he has that long military career and had a long career as a teacher before becoming an elected official, I think, will weigh very favorably for him amongst just voters generally. Walls has polled well with young people and with workers better than Democrats nationwide. He also performed better in Minnesota among white people without a college degree than Democrats do on average nationally. Not like stellar, he didn't perform stellar, but better than average for most Democrats nationally. These are all positive signs, but we aren't gonna know an accurate temperature of voter feelings on him right now until they're able to get some polling now that he's been announced as a running mate. I mean, this is, brand new. So we got to wait for the data to come in. And I'll also remind you that polling has a like two to 4% margin of error. Most polls right now are calling the race really close. So within that margin of error, we're also asking people to tell us something that they're going to do three months from now. Is that really that close? God. Um, and so how accurate is it going to be? It's up in the air. So don't put all your eggs in the polling basket. You know what I mean? Um, but I think as long as the Democrats keep up the good work with the social media campaign, I don't know what Gen Zers they hired, but they're doing an excellent job. And I can see Walls and Harris having a really good rapport with each other that could be fodder for great content because I think they're both kind of silly and goofy, which we love a goofy little guy, okay? And if they focus on pushing Walls' background and pedigree, especially for moderate voters, I think he could really round out the ticket nicely. And I could also see him doing really well in a vice presidential debate against Vance. I think someone who's actually a man of the people on stage next to Yale Law graduate brown noser Vance would really create a nice contrast that I think could hurt Vance's standing with moderate and swing voters. As for the polls and Harris on her own, she's been erasing Trump's leads that were in the polls and closing the gap that existed when Biden was the nominee. Four in 10 voters in a recent poll said they're more likely to vote now that she's on the ticket. Four in 10. That's a sign of... Uh, a lot of enthusiasm that was not there with Biden. And when more people show up to vote, Democrats usually win. That's why Republicans are trying to illegitimize, delegitimize all the elections that are happening, because they know that the more people that turn out to vote, the more uh, Democrats are going to win. And that freaks them out. So the fact that more voters want to show up now that Harris is in the running, I think, is a great sign. Her approval rating is going up and her disapproval rating is going down. And she's seeing growth and support from key demographics like Gen Z, Black and Hispanic voters. OK, but that had me wondering, too, are we just in some sort of honeymoon phase? You know, why are people excited about her? Is this going to go away sometime soon? Um, here's why I think she's exciting and why, why I hope that they're able to keep up this momentum, because I think there's a lot of reasons why people are excited about her. Um, first of all, she's genuinely likable. She's a little goofy. She can relax. She can have a fun time. Her and her husband genuinely seem to like each other. There's not this like political stiffness that you see in a lot of other politicians. She's young. She's 59. Like that's a great age because she has had the time to have experience, but she's not on death's fucking doorstep, you know? And Walls is 60, just one year older than her. So they're both younger than Trump, but have more experience than Vance. So it feels feels like a really nice middle ground, which is exciting. Uh, Harris is also exciting because she represents a growing majority of this country who have never seen themselves in the president. That is women and women of color. OK, that's just exciting to see. I was very distracted by all of the hubbub around Biden stepping down and her getting the nominee that it was like scary at first. But once all of that died down, it became kind of like a oh, my God, not to get naive and too excited like we were in 2016 uh, with Hillary, but like. What if this is the year? What if this is our year? I don't know. That's an exciting prospect. Um, and she has genuine progressive credentials. I went over this uh, whenever she, whenever Biden stepped down, I can't remember it, like all time is running together now, but I talked about her progressive credentials. People like to call her a cop, but like 
within her prosecutorial space, she did a lot of really amazing progressive things like re-entry programs for convicted felons and, um, you know, she, so many other things that I don't have written down in front of me to list right now. Please do a Google search. The accusation of her being a, a cop who's tough on crime is like not really founded in a lot of fact. I think there are definitely things to criticize about her, but to say that like, she contributed to mass incarceration of like low level weed crimes is actually not really factually accurate uh, if you look it up. So, um, and she seems more willing to be pushed on issues. She seems more willing to be pushed on Israel-Palestine. She seems more willing to be open-minded to things. And I think that's the type of politician we want. You're never gonna find a politician who aligns with you perfectly on all your issues, but you want one who's willing to listen and to be pushed. Even if they're a little, uh, you know, hesitant or they're not all the way there where you would like them to be, a willingness and an openness, I think, is frankly a rarity these days. And I think she has that. And I don't think expecting perfection from your elected officials, especially in the presidency, is a very realistic thing to do because you're never going to find it. You're never going to find it. And I, and I don't think that that's what we should be looking for in a president. I think we should be focused more on local and state elections. And as long as the president is someone who's not going to fuck up the status quo so much that it's going to undo, I don't know, 50 years of, uh, you know, civil rights precedent, uh, that's good for me. That's good for me. We'll keep doing the work on the ground. Just don't be a fucking fascist. That, those are the criteria. Okay. Um, also, I've been noticing, I don't know if you've noticed this in your uh, TikTok timeline, if you're uh, as chronically online as I am. Um, she has been showing up in a lot of like fan cam videos. <laughs> People just mashing together videos of her with like Chapel Roan songs in the background. And I am here for it. Okay. I saw a lot of criticism from people being like, oh my God, this is hero worship. Like we shouldn't be, you know, putting her on this pedestal. We should never put any politician on a pedestal. And let me just say a fan cam is not a pedestal. Okay. A fan cam is something that is actually making people realize that she's really likable. She can be goofy and funny and fun. And I think that's what we need to see in politics. It's making people have kind of a levity and a feeling of hope in their politicians. And that can come with criticism. Also, a lot of this is Gen Zers making these videos. Gen Zers have been through so much bullshit in their lives, they're never not gonna be critical. They're never not gonna look at politics with a critical eye. And so I think it's okay to want to elevate someone who has a lot of positive progressive qualities, even if there is room to criticize her, and to say, hey, I'm actually feeling excited about a politician for the first time in, I don't know, eight years. That's cool. That's fun. That's exciting. Just because you want to critique everything and be critical of everything doesn't mean that your takes are smart, okay? Just being a contrarian does not mean that your takes are smart. I caution you away from being a contrarian just for the sake of being a contrarian, because for some reason in the Democrats, we have to constantly be criticizing and there can never be even one ounce of like positivity, lest you be seen as naive and a sellout and whatever the fuck else. We can be excited. You, I give you permission to be excited. Hold your politicians accountable, continue looking at them with a critical eye, but you're also allowed to feel some hope. And I think that it's important to feel hope because that is what gets people off the sofa to go and vote. And that's what matters now. We need to get people to vote. Again, the more people turn out to vote, the better Democrats do. And we need to stop fighting over the basics of should I show up to vote at all? A presidential election is not the time or place to start being an activist. You need to be doing the hard grassroots work on the ground in local politics, with local organizations, with policy building, with lobbying, in order to make real change happen. Sitting out a vote because you don't perfectly align with a presidential candidate is not the activism that you think it is. And it's actually hurting more people because the fewer people that vote, the more likely a Republican is to win. And that Republican is Donald Trump and he's willing to do anything and everything to grab as much power as humanly possible. And so I beg of you, please vote figure out how to register to vote. I'll tell you, go to vote.gov, okay? Check your ballot and your voting schedule. Register at vote.gov. Learn about mail-in, absentee, and early voting if that's something that you're interested in. Check state and local elections as well. Um, in Minnesota, we have a dead tie. 
in our Senate. And if Waltz becomes vice president, that creates an opening for lieutenant mayor that will be filled depending on who wins a majority in the Minnesota Senate this November, which is down to a single special election race in District 45 in the Lake Minnetonka area of Minnesota, which is where I grew up. So check out my Instagram for more info if you're in Minnesota. This is an example of how much local politics can matter and how much it can have a real tangible effect on your day-to-day -day life. I have already signed up to help with the campaign in that district, because even though I don't live there, my family still lives there, I still feel a connection to it, and I think I can still contribute. Campaign for local politics, volunteer, show up, phone bank, table. There's a lot that you can do to get out the vote locally, and the more people you can get excited about local elections, the more likely they're going to show up just generally in November and vote Democrat all the way down the ticket. And that's what we need to create change and to create a progressive momentum so that we are in the right position to make change happen nationally when the opportunity presents itself, okay? Local politics matters. It matters. And I am starting to feel hope, excitement about the presidential race since Kamala took over for the first time, like I said, since mm, the day before election night, 2016. And Tim Waltz definitely adds to that, but the reality is we need progressives up and down the ticket because change happens at all levels, but especially locally. So please make sure you're registered and ready. Primaries in Minnesota are this Tuesday, August 13th, okay? And that's the quick and dirty down low on this VP pick. This is a short one today because I've had a lot of caffeine and I spoke somehow even faster than I usually do. So I hope um, this was helpful and I hope you're feeling fucking fired up because I know I am. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.